Okay, so uh, hello everyone and welcome back. And today, um, so today I'll be the chair for for this session. Uh, and to uh, start things, uh, we have Professor Maxime Chernodoub from the Institute uh, from the Poisson Institute in Tours, France, and also the uh, Pacific Quantum Center in Vladivostok, Russia. And he will talk about transport effects due to scale anomaly. Uh, so. Please, Professor. Okay, thank you for the invitation to give the talk. So I must apologize if someone heard uh, some part of this talk before because it's uh, they are moving to recycle the world. Kind of... oh, sorry, someone interfered. Yeah, so <laughs> it's it's a recycle talk in the sense that um, I also gave it before, so I apologize if there are some correlations with uh, what I said before. Uh, okay, so this talk is. Um, uh, about uh, transport effects due to scale anomaly. And I will first give some introduction, what does it mean scale anomaly? And in fact, it has many, many different pieces. So it's kind of a Lego. So in principle, I can stop at some particular point. So please, if you would like to have some, if you have some question, please interrupt me, then I will just give a little bit shorter one, but it's kind of modulable. So one can consist of different parts. Okay, so first, oh, now I have to change. Uh, so this is plan, general plan of the lecture. So first of all, I will discuss briefly Relativistic crystals, uh, relativistic physics in crystals in direct and velocity metals, briefly because it was already discussed yesterday. Then also briefly discuss quantum anomalies, anomalous transport effects. It was also discussed, so that I will just proceed fast. Then I uh, will discuss the difference between scale anomaly and chiral anomalies. Uh, what is different between those two? And to try to uh, elucidate a little bit the, um, how scale anomaly can be considered in the gravity context, in the curved background, uh, for example. Then, uh, if we have time, we will talk about uh, scale anomaly, gravity, and thermoelectric transport, thermomagnetic transport. And finally, uh, uh, approach the important question of scale anomaly and whether it can use some transport at the boundaries of the crystals. So I would like to say that I would like to quote two papers. Uh, one of them is famous paper by Lattinger, who said that in fact, if the gravitational field did not exist, one could invent it for the purposes of this paper. So he said that it's very important to, to study, you know, to study the uh, thermoelectric, thermomagnetic transport. It's important, to, actually, general thermal transport in crystals. It's important to have the knowledge about the gravitational field. One should introduce it. Another one, which is my favorite habit, would say that uh, basically the gravity is a habit that you cannot get rid of. So it's always with you. <laughs> so you must have it. Okay. Uh, yes. And uh, here is, yeah, I cited, oh, by the way, it's yesterday. It's not yesterday. It's, um, there, I would like to refer to this paper where uh, we have some. Uh, Ref, we have some review of the gravitational and the, in fact, uh, and the, the um, uh, thermomagnetic, thermoelectric transports described here, including also the uh, conformal anomaly. Okay, so this is optimistic, optimistic talk uh, in the sense that uh, optimistic schedule. I don't know if I have uh, time to uh, to come to it uh, correctly. So, okay, so what's to fit all, to describe all the topics. So let me briefly mention that we will talk about relativistic, uh, mainly about relativistic physics and crystals. And you should know about uh, graphene as a two-dimensional, famous dimensional example, which uh, has a specific bond structure with some cone type of um, parts, uh, which are uh, which are important because they have no gap. So basically no mass. It, they describe relativistic fermions, which are propagating the two-dimensional crystal with velocity, which is not Fermi velocity, but uh, 300 times smaller velocity. That's velocity, yeah, Fermi velocity is not velocity of light. So in that sense, uh, <clears throat> There is no equivalent into space-time dimensions, but still we have kind of uh, two-dimensional physics also with the broken relativistic, and I would say broken Lorentz invariance because velocity of propagation of uh, the, those excitations, massless excitations is not the speed of light, but thermal velocity, which is smaller. Uh, the, <clears throat> there are also relativistic uh, examples of in three-dimensional crystals, obviously pseudo-relativistic in the sense that, as again, the velocity is not speed of light of those particles, but smaller, but still it's quite high. Uh, that's appear, for example, in wild sea metals and deoxy metals, which have also some cone type of um, uh, profiles of the 
uh, in the bound spectrum. So the these particles, the effective excitations propagate as the um, with some constant velocity and they're gapless. So it's an interesting example to have the uh, material which represents basically kind of standard model of fundamental interactions, but in the crystal. And uh, I will be mostly speaking about Dirac fermions and Dirac materials. So in that sense, you can, if you work, uh, say, for example, in the field theory or in the um, in the condensed matter, or you can use different language. You can use language of uh, quantum field theoretical formulation, where the simplest model, which describes gapless from Dirac fermions, is described just by this simple model, where you have the um, kinetic energy for the for the fluctuating gauge field plus interaction of that gauge field, so electromagnetic field, with the Dirac fermion here, which is massless, it has no mass and interacts uh, with the electromagnetic background uh, just uh, as linear, just a minimal sense. Okay, and if you are coming from condensed matter side, you can write just simply this Hamiltonian and say, okay, here we have here this interaction, so this part will remain the same, but this one will be a little bit different, so here we have uh, just interaction between okay between particles uh, your excitations and the electromagnetic ground here i put uh, a naught component to zero for simplicity the only difference with the, this formulation will be that here we have again thermal velocity which will break Lorentz invariance of the system so you have relativistic spectrum of electronic quasi particle close to fermi surface and in this crystal you will basically have relativistic physics okay and uh, then one should describe different types of fermions. One can have the Dirac fermions and Bell fermions. The difference between the two is that in the Dirac fermions, the two bands of left-handed and right-handed fermions, they overlap with each other. So <clears throat> I'll discuss it a little bit later. And in Bell fermions, those bands are separated either in energy direction or in the uh, momentum direction. So I will be talking mainly about Dirac uh, semi metals. And the difference between those bonds can be suited the following way. If you have the massless particles, magnetic massless particle, then you have uh, the uh, conserved quantity in addition to other quantities. You'll have conserved quantity, which is called chirality, or one can also formulate it in terms of helicity. So for massless particles, uh, you can see that okay, you have massless particles, particle propagating along. Say one direction, you suppose that it's not interacting with anything, so just going along one direction. And momentum k uh, will have quantum number, which, uh, which we know as uh, chirality. So it says that, okay, if momentum is along the spin or spin along momentum, they're elongated, uh, they just put post along one direction, then this is right handed particle. And if those two spins, uh, those two directions are in opposite, directed in opposite ways, then you have left handed particles. So the number of left handed and right handed particles in this model uh, is conserved at the classical levels. And that's why in this model, you can write two different types of currents. You can write vector current, which we usually call electric current. And you can call also axial current, which is uh, basically what we also often call chiral current. So the difference between the two is that vector current is just sum of number of left-handed particles and right-handed particles. So, and the axial current is the difference between those two. So this one carries electric charge, and this one doesn't carry electric charge. That's all. And <clears throat> There is also another, so, okay. And those currents, they are related to some specific invariances. I will discuss them later. Uh, but there is also one thing here, which is also very interesting, is that this theory has conformal invariance. So what's been conformal invariance? Come before, let's consider classical symmetry of the simple Lagrangian. Again, we can consider it at high energy notations, particle physics notation this way, or in solid state notations, you can think about this type of Hamiltonian in simplest case. Okay, and then uh, you have the theory has, has vector symmetry, gauge symmetry, which corresponds to just multiplication of uh, the Higgs field of, of the um, of the uh, Dirac field by the phase. And uh, this invariance, according to Nelson's theorem, says that vector current is classically conserved. So it's, we have charge conservation. Uh, axial current corresponds to the same type of transformation. The only thing that you have here, gamma five fifth uh, gamma matrix. And it means that left-handed and right-handed fermions will transfer in opposite uh, with opposite phases. Then it means that the axial current is conserved. So you get conservation of uh, classical conservation of the vector current, classical conservation of axial current. So basically it say that here you have left-handed and right-handed fermions. So if you have a current of them in the theory, uh, even if theory is interacting, so it has the 
interaction with, with the, the electromagnetic field, still electric charge will be conserved. That's natural. We know that electric charge is conserved. So that's conservation of this current. And then this uh, statement says that number of left handed fermions minus number of right handed fermions is also conserved. So if it has, you have it before, you will have it after, after they interact with each other. So that's also axial, axial conservation. However, this theory has another symmetry, which is not often discussed. That's called scale symmetry. And people also call it conformal symmetry, but better to call it scale. Uh, and uh, that symmetry is very simple. So you say, okay, if you multiply uh, every coordinate and every uh, every field uh, by corresponding factor by the factor lambda in the, the dimension which corresponds to its canonical dimension, then this uh, this theory will stay invariant. What they mean by canonical dimension means that here we have uh, x, so distance, it has to be multiplied divided by lambda. If you have quantity of mass, it should be multiplied by lambda. Psi in uh, the field of thermion in three plus one dimensions has dimension three over two, uh, mass to the power three over two. Then you have to multiply by lambda. So if you have this multiplication, if you multiply, make this change in the action of the theory, then actually it will stay the same. And classical equations of motion, it will stay the same. So it means that all processes which appear at small scales and large scales in the theory, they will look the same. So you would not guess what is the size of the system, just look into how it evolves in time or in space. Okay, it's impossible. Theory is so-called scale invariant. One millimeter is, is the same as one, one, one per second. They will evolve exactly in the same way. And since uh, you have the scale invariance, then you may ask, okay, what, according to Nessel's theorem, what is conserved then? because you must have some conserved current and that current is called dilatation current so this dilatation current corresponds to multiplication of coordinate convolution of coordinates with the energy momentum tensor and one can show that this current is automatically conserved as classical equations of motion on classical equations of motion and uh, in fact it will be given the derivative of this current will be given to the trace of energy momentum tensor and energy momentum tensor, which is given by this complicated expression, long expression for the theory, is automatically okay, is automatically zero. So you just take okay, sorry trace of energy momentum tensor. So you take this expression, take a trace, and you will see that it will be just automatically zero. So it's just algebraic identity. That's why let me summarize. Classically, in this theory, you will have vector symmetry. So it, you will get vector current conserved, which is electric current. It's normal, it's obvious. Then you have axial symmetry, which is less obvious, but it says that, okay, it means that you have left and right handed number of, if you have number of left and right handed particles, it will also be conserved in the, if you evolve the system in space. And also you will have this scale anomaly, which corresponds to the conservation of this specific dilatation current, which is inherently connected with energy momentum tensor. So you have three symmetries. Okay. And the next step, okay, what is the energy momentum tensor? Let me flash briefly from Wikipedia. So for those who have to refresh uh, uh, this, uh, this notion. So this is tensor four by four, which corresponds to, which has here elements, here is energy density, here is uh, pressure. This is one is pressure. Here we have shear stress and here we have momentum density. So how much uh, momentum is transferred through the, through the along some directions so basically this is this is energy momentum tensor and for electromagnetic field uh okay so in equilibrium in, in static equilibrium uh, for the tropic system it has just uh this element here has uh, pressure oh, sorry, sorry it has has it has uh, the meaning of energy density and those three numbers they, which are filled uh, they are just pressure since system is isotropic, all pressures are in directions are the same. So you have here energy density, pressure, pressure, pressure. And all other elements are zero because you have no energy transfer. So the scale anomaly, if you have no scale, if you have no scale, if you have, uh, if you have scale symmetry, it means that this trace is zero. So rho plus my, rho, rho minus 3p, rho minus 3p must be equal to uh, zero. I say minus because it should be convoluted with the, um, with the metric tensor, which has minus elements either here or there. So, and so this is this is a classical scale symmetry and it's broken, it is broken if, and only if uh, okay, trace energy, the uh, energy of uh, trace of energy momentum tensor is non zero, it means that energy minus three pressures are not equal to zero. And that appears often in interacting theories and those theories on quantum level, the system becomes broken. 
So that's what I'm talking about. Now, let me say briefly about terminology. I don't have time to discuss this in details, but people often say that, okay, you can have either scale anomaly or conformal anomaly or trace anomaly or while anomaly. That very much depends on which context you talk. So I will talk about scale anomaly. So scale anomaly means that you have, or scale symmetry. So scale symmetry means that you have some object, for example, here it is just, you know, some, some, some object and you can just multiply it all coordinates by the same direction, by the same quantity, and it just becomes bigger or smaller. Conformal transformation is a little bit more complicated. It means that you, I can just deform it, but in such a way that parallel curves or say, sorry, perpendicular curves at every point remain perpendicular curves. So it means that co the, the coordinate uh, is, if it was orthogonal system will stay orthogonal. So it's a little bit more complicated. It was more bigger number of generators. But if you uh, have a physical theory uh, which obeys certain rules, which are natural, if you look more carefully, more or less natural, some locality, you know, from terrain variance and so on, then uh, you can show that, okay, not show, but you can see that those two symmetries are basically the same. So with some specific counterexamples, but basically for all good theory, conformal and scale are the same. And there are also, also named trace anomaly, which means that, okay, that this trace is non-zero, trace of energy momentum tensor will become non-zero, so it's natural. And in vial anomaly is uh, people discuss it in gravitational context, so I cannot discuss it right now in details. So we'll, I will be talking in scale, about scale anomaly, but I can also use word conformal, which is basically the same. So now let me flash about anomalies, what we know about anomalies in this simple theory. First of all, there is axial anomaly. Uh, Carl Steiner was talking about them and also about mixed anomalies. So I will briefly mention that uh, only. So axial anomaly means the following. So if you have the energy momentum, if you have say um, your theory again, and if you put it into the background of electromagnetic fields, then the axial current gets unconserved. So here everything is written in, uh, the units were h bar and c are equal to one. So to save time and save space. So it means that, so for example, this term means that it's, you have parallel electric current, or oh, sorry, electric, um, electric field and magnetic field. So if you have parallel electric field and magnetic field, this part will become non-zero. This is a product of magnetic tensor. And this part will become non-zero. And then the uh, axial current uh, will not be conserved. So you can generate axial charge due to uh, the axial anomaly. In terms of Feynman diagrams, it means that the presence of this triangular plot, this triangular uh, Feynman diagram, which is non-zero, and it means that basically it means the following. So here we have two uh, vertices corresponding to background electromagnetic field. Uh, so it corresponds to vector gauge field and one vertex which corresponds to axial field. So sorry, to axial current. So if you have parallel electric magnetic fields, they, they will just generate your axial charge. It will be done conservation of axial current. Uh, no, conservation, yes, of axial charge. There is also mixed axial gravitational anomaly, which is similar to that, but it's more complicated in the sense that you don't need electromagnetic field, but you need curved space time. So if you have curved space time, imagine some black hole or our sun, sun uh, you will get that. In fact, uh, axial charge will not be conserved. And the situation is the same, basically, uh, instead of interaction with gravitational field, you will interact with graviton. So you can imagine this way. In fact, if you have, for example, a right-handed, uh, right say, fermion coming far outside from the galaxy, if it comes here and it turns nearby, uh, passes through the field of uh, the star, positional field, the star, which is rotating, it's important, which must be rotating to have this, uh, this part non-zero, then in this background, you will get that uh, due to quantum effects, the right-hand uh, right chirality can flip to left-hand chirality. So with the meeting of graviton. So basically you will have here some process that corresponds to mixed axial gravitational anomaly. Okay. And there is also trace anomaly and the trace anomaly corresponds also to triangle. Uh, this triangle diagram, it's also, you can see here, we have here graviton and here two vector fields. And here by graviton, so here entrance here, graviton means that you have energy momentum tensor because graviton, gravity couples to energy momentum tensor, so it's natural to have graviton here. And you have also, oh yeah, sorry, 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 let me just, let me say it differently. It's better to look here, it's better to look here. So we have here energy momentum tensor, which corresponds to graviton. 
so it's a uh, trace from geometry tensor on the left hand side on the right hand side you'll have f menu so it's your background it's uh, energy momentum uh, sorry it's uh, the um, magnetic field and electric field these are field strengths of electric and magnetic fields so it means that if you have background of electric and magnetic fields here i will discuss in details later what does it mean uh, then you get the trace from geometry tensor becomes non zero so it's very similar, a little bit kind of similar visually to, for example, to axial anomaly or to Max Smith's gravitational anomaly. So in a sense, you have on one hand side you have a conservation of current. On the other, on the other hand, on the other side, you have some 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 two different fields, two different um, tensors which uh, convolute together and then give you some non-zero value in some specific classical background. So and. I will be talking about this one. So it say that tensor of energy momentum, ten, energy momentum tensor, trace of it is non zero in the background of uh, electromagnetic field. Also, there will be gravitational corrections as well, but I will not talk about them right now. And here there is an important object which is called beta function. Okay. So, what does it mean beta function and how to measure this anomaly? So, for a moment, I forget about axial anomalies and axial gravitational anomalies. I'll talk about only scale anomaly to introduce the subject, which is actually not very often appears in the condensed matter literature and solid state physics. So, what is scale anomaly and what is beta function? Okay, so the idea is that, again, let's look again to the theory for massless Dirac fermions. Forget for a second about mass. <clears throat> we have this conservation. And in fact, it turns out that <coughs> due to quantum effects, you have so-called char screening so what does it mean it means that if you for example put your particle this is particle uh, just test particle which you know very well you measured you know its size so, so you know it's 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 a value of electric charge if you put it inside the vacuum then due to quantum fluctuations the pairs of electrons and positrons will appear from the vacuum they will pop up and disappear pop up and disappear you can think about them as if you think about say thermal fluctuations so they appear or disappear and since they appear or disappear they will leave a little bit some time short time and when they leave they feel this field they feel the field electromagnetic field of this background charge and it will start to orient themselves in such a way that negative uh positive, so negative particle that electron will start to attach to your try to turn to your to your positive charge and vice versa negative ch positive charge will try to will get repulsed a little bit from your from your uh, test charge so that's why there will be kind of this type of orientation which you would expect to to have in some dielectric where you put also test electric charge but now we talk about vacuum so you'll see that there'll be kind of screening of your electric charge and it will appear due to quantum fluctuations and if you come closer to the charge you will see the charge will be bigger you will see kind of stronger attraction to it or repulsion depending on who you are charged you are positive or negative so if you come to that you'll see either repulsion or attraction or uh, if you come far away you will see the charge more and more screened and you say wow i don't feel this charge because i'm far away from that so for you the appearance of the charge will become dependent on the distance however let me say that we are working in a mass theory where you have no i mean you have no no measure of unity it's you know it's it's of distance it's, it's scale invariant theory so what i say right now it means that your scale invariance gets broken by quantum fluctuations because if your theory would not you wouldn't have quantum fluctuations then you would measure the charge and the charge would look to you the same regardless of the distance you look at it closer or far away you just go slow and you measure this you know interaction with that and that's all you don't really need to uh, to care about the charge and here charge will become dependent quantity and what we say it will run it will run with the scale with the distance so the uh the important point here is that okay we don't talk actually about distances in, in energy physics we talk about energies so because to bring one positron to another positron you need to energy big energy to collide them and we say that charge run with energy in reality it means it runs with distance so it depends on the distance and beta function is just to measure how this electric charge depends on the your energy scale of colliding ions or, or sorry electrons or you can think about also distance how close they are or how far they are and in QED with one Dirac fermions, this is quantum electrodynamics with massless one fermions, this beta function can be calculated and it just also expressed through the charge itself. So it's some number. And the presence of this number means that you have a breaking of chiral, uh, sorry, of uh, conformal invariance. So you have breaking of conformal invariance, the theory starts to depend on the distance. And coming back, uh, that's why you have this beta function here. So you get dependence of the of uh, the uh, you see you have no zero value with some specific conditions in the presence of electromagnetic fields you have 
you have non-zero value of energy momentum trace, and it means that you have non conservation of dilatation current. But dilatation current, as we discussed before, it's related, this conservation is related to scale invariance. So it's, it's logical. So you have breaking of scale invariance by quantum effects, and that's why uh, you have non conservation of dilatation current, which gives you non-zero energy momentum trace uh, in the background of quantum fluctuations. So quantum fluctuations give you a zero value of uh, the trace of energy momentum. That's, that, that's called scale anomaly. Okay, and then you say, okay, it's scale anomaly. So again, I repeat, it's known as scale conformal trace or while anomalies. Maybe there are other names which I don't know. And the question is, okay, whether we can measure it. In, in high energy physics, we can measure. Let me just very briefly mention that it was measured at the Venus experiment. Here there is, uh, you know, a few pixel, uh, few pixels here. This is a person. This is a big experiment in Japan, and they basically say that how the uh, this alpha alpha is a fine structure constant, which uh, here this combination of electric charge squared divided by some factor. How this alpha depends with the energy of collision, and the energy of collision is was very high. It's uh, scattering of electrons and positrons for the temperature approximately 10 to 14 Kelvin. It corresponds to this type of kinetic energy corresponds to this type, uh, yeah, this uh, this high temperature. And they measured. They really found that actually the charge of the particle changes with the distance, with the energies of colliding ions, and uh, it runs well with the theory. So we do really see an experiment and this huge experiment that indeed the, the uh, coupling runs. Now you say, okay, it's nice, but we are talking at uh, basically a topology and about materials. Okay, let's talk, let's talk about materials. I will briefly flash this transparency, just saying that I am not, I'm saying correct things. So, uh, okay, first of all, this running, okay, how to say that correctly? Mm, let me just, because it's transparency, I need to talk about this half an hour, but I have a few minutes. So consider a topological insulator or uh, say it's almost the same as Dirac semi-metal. So what does it mean? It means that we consider some quantity, we consider some Lagrangian. This Lagrangian says what, is, what, it, what it describes. You have here uh, Dirac fermion, so not while, Dirac fermion, which, which goes around. It has some mass. We assume that mass is zero for a second. So mass is zero, doesn't matter. We have also electromagnetic fields, E and V which are fluctuating, so everything is quantum. Uh, then electromagnetic field interacts with your fermions, so this is particle density, charge density, and it interacts also with, okay, with, 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 the, with the special components of, of the Maxwell field. So here one should say that you have two different uh, velocities. You have velocity speed of light, here C, which appears everywhere, and you have also Fermi velocity. velocity this Fermi velocity controls how your uh, fermion propagates. So fermions propagate with the Fermi velocity and speed of light propagates with the speed of light, which is fixed. So in that theory, so this is theory, you can consider a normalization group. You can just really calculate all the beta functions. And then you will find that electric charge start depend on the momentum of uh, interactions. So you will see that in fact, your Fermi velocity will be dependent on uh, the, or I would say distances at which you look at, at which you, on, on the wave, I would say on the, on the wave number or on the length of the wave, um, which you, at which your particles propagating. Now we, co we consider massless particles. So you can say that, okay, so you have some Fermi velocity. So for example, uh, the particles with high energies corresponding to short distances, they propagate with low velocities. But then once you accelerate, you know, once you kind of consider, um, okay, not accelerate better to say, once you consider lo longer distances, so if you consider again, slow down. So you slow down your particle at, at larger distances, the Fermi velocity will start to increase. On the other hand, speed of light in your material speed of light will start to decrease with the, with, the, with, the, with the distance. So if you, for example, consider the length of your wave, which will increase in, in, in size. So you consider lower and lower energies. So larger and larger wavelengths of your particle, of your light, the velocity or speed of light will decrease with the increasing of this wave number, wavelength. So it means that uh, your uh, numbers, your speed of light and Fermi velocity, and by the way, also the electric charge will not stay constant. Uh, those will be numbers which will depend on the energy uh, of, your, uh, of your particles. For example, if you consider short distances, so uh, wavelength is, uh, okay, so wavelength is very small, so short distances, when you probe a system at short distances, then you will see that the electric charge will, will be high because you're coming closer to your test charge. So it's, we are very close and nothing can screen it. But once you go to larger distances, then this kind of scheme of um, particle antiparticles or electrons and holes will appear from the, your vacuum. 
and it will screen your test charge and the electric charge will disappear. So notice here the, uh, the scale, which is, uh, which is logarithmic. So it will keep disappear. In fact, it's, it's not so logarithmic. It will be just, okay, I will not talk in details, but it is here is also logarithmic, but there will be some interesting effects. So you see that uh, from a velocity, speed of light and electric charge run, that was found actually in graphene. It was found in solid state applications like topology conservative of metals, and also appeared in standard model of particles as well, because people also considered some Lorentz invariant phenomena there. So it should be- Short question. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, in, in this plot, the kappa, uh, kappa, is it like the inverse of the mu scale that you had in the running of a yeah. charge? So kappa, so, so kappa here corresponds to, you see, this is long distances. So kappa corresponds to momentum. So it's basically to energy. So here we have kappa naught, which is fixed, and you have kappa, which is basically energy. So the larger, so the smaller energy you have, the more, the bigger wavelength, wavelength you have. So the bigger, the longer distances you probe. Okay, thank you. So that's, yeah, so the other ones, these are large distances. That's basically screening phenomena, but in, in, in field theory, it only appears with the electric charge because the speed of light and Fermi velocities are the same. But once they are, okay, obviously speed of light is the same for, for particles and, and uh, for the, uh, for the speed of the light itself, but in condensed matter, they are different and um, there is running of speed of light and thermal velocity as well. So we do have such applications in topological materials because this is materials topological. Okay, and uh, there is also running of the thermal velocity in graphene. I will briefly mention that it was the first uh, example where it was found, two-dimensional graphene, one could find that thermal velocity runs with the energy. In, but on the contrary, in, in graphene, there is no running of electric charge. So electric charge will stay always the same. But from a velocity will, will run with the energy. So it means that the bigger energy you have, the, okay, will do the some logarithmic correction, do some logarithmic correction to the velocity of, uh, this is from velocity of propagation of thermals. And you can say, okay, what does it mean? It means the following. So if you, for example, consider the uh, usual fermions, uh, you just basically type the type binding model, this type binding model, the, uh, the dispersion relations for graphene particles, for electric, electric incitations in, in graphene, would be just two cones. They will be kind of two cones, and the velocity of the particle would not depend on its momentum, so, or energy, because it's linear. So it will be just like that. However, if you take into account quantum corrections, you will find that the velocity will change. And for example, for, for smaller momenta, it means lower energy, velocity, which is the slope of this curve, will be kind of higher. In reality, it would diverge theoretically at the distance, at, at, very, very, at large distances, at very, very small momenta. Where large momenta means long wavelengths, so big distances. So that means that uh, this profile, this profile of this dispersion relation would be not a cone, but kind of a hard glass, this kind of hard glass. And this type of behavior has been measured in this nature physics paper. I have no time to, to stop there to discuss in details, but this type of behavior has been measured and it was attributed to this running of velocity. Right now, people understand that there are more phenomena maybe that contribute to this, to this particular effect because actually in graphene, we don't have a decoupling regime. So this is, this is done in perturbation theory in decoupling regime. But okay, I will not discuss this in details. I would like to say that this could be the manifestation of the running velocity uh, in graphene. So it's one of the interesting examples which were perfected theoretically and then found uh, experimentally in real, in, in, in real graphene, in, in real system. So in any way, we know that uh, the F, uh, so Fermi velocity should run with energy. That's, that's clearly seen here. Okay. so. Quantum anomaly, if you have some anomaly, you must have some transport. Again, I don't have so much time. I just very briefly flash transparencies. It was mentioned yesterday already, and I think a few times. So if you have axial anomaly, uh, so just in conservation of axial current in the presence of electromagnetic fields, then you must have non conservation. By the way, this is just written like that. So this part means that you have derivative of the electric uh, of axial charge density. So number of left-handed fermions minus right-handed fermions and um, divided by volume. So this density is um, so derivative of the density plus uh, divergence of the axial current is proportional to electric charge time, or oh, sorry, electric um, field times magnetic field. So basically, F of dual is just electric times magnetic. 
fields. And in the presence of collinear electric and magnetic fields, you will get in conservation of the axial uh, charge. And that law will lead to the chiral separation and chiral magnetic effects, which were mentioned yesterday. So basically, the magnetic effect means that you will have the electric uh, current along uh, magnetic lines uh, in the presence of imbalance, so in the presence of different number of left and right handed fermions. That is called axial chiral magnetic effect. It appears due to axial anomaly. And similar effects appear also for mixed axial gravitational anomaly, which were discussed yesterday as well. So that means that basically you have a conservation of, of, of axial charge and, and gravitational background, but that can be converted, for example, into this coefficient in the rotating plasma. So if you have chiral plasma, fermions rotated, you will see that at finite temperature, you will get some axial current along the rotation uh, axis of the um, rotational axis of this gas. So if you rotate it with some constant angular moment or angular moment, oh sorry, angular velocity, yes, it's called angular velocity. If you rotate it with constant angular velocity, omega, then you'll get axial current, which will be proportional to T squared. And this six is related to this horrible coefficient here. So they are related to each other very well. Okay, and so this is this is this example of mixed axial and rotational anomaly. There are others. And for conformal anomaly, you can also ask what, what's that? What you will get with conformal anomaly? Because conformal anomaly means to non conservation of some unusual dilatation current. What is that? And it means basically that the trace of energy momentum tensor is non zero. And so what? Do we get some new kind of uh, transport law there or, or what? So the question is yes. So uh, the answer, okay, the, the, the answer is yes for, to this question. So electric currents, they uh, be generated by the skeleton thermal anomalies in curved backgrounds. Because as we see that this, uh, those effects are related to the presence of gravity anyway. So let me just very briefly mention uh, what we will get here. So in the oversimplified, you know, for simplified picture is the following. So if you have some gravitational background, in this case, I consider a very simple background where we have just flat Minkowski space time, so just our flat space. And then you a little bit modified by some um, multiplication factor. I will explain a little bit later what does it mean. Then, due to this anomaly, due to the presence of conformal anomaly, you will get some currents. They're written in Lorentz invariant form, which say that you'll get electric current, which is proportional to beta function, to this derivative of this dilatation factor and to electromagnetic field, F mu. So I would like to say that this is a uh, fact which appears in the pure vacuum. So you, there is no matter and there is no temperature. So it appears from nothing. It appears just in the vacuum, the presence of curved space time and the uh, ground electromagnetic field. Okay, so the question is uh, the last, okay, from the last slide, let me say that we are working, what does it mean from condensed matter perspective? It means that we are working at actually at the tip of Dirac, uh, of Dirac spectrum. So it means that if you, you work here, for example, that means that you have number of um, holes, okay, number of holes and number of electrons carriers is just the same. So basically you stay at this point at the uh, charge neutrality point, first thing. And second thing, you have to work at zero temperature. So you don't have any excitation. So no charge can drop there, uh, come here and uh, leave here behind it a hole. So in this Fermi picture, so you stay basically here. So you have neutral vacuum, only quantum excitation may excite you something from here to there. That's all. So, <clears throat> so from condensed matter perspective, we, evolve, we work at the Dirac tip. So from a level must go exactly through, through, this, through this point. And there is no other points in, in, your, in your system, only that. Okay, and then what is scale magnetic effect? Uh, scale magnetic effect is the following. First of all, let's assume that you have, let's come back again, look to this formula, which I wrote here. And let's assume that you have only electric field here. So electric field, that's all. You apply electric field. And you can get that you will generate the electric current in vacuum in the background, which is uh, which is this type of metric. It's called the metric. So you have kind of a, a background, which is, uh, which is, for example, expanding. Think about universe in the inflation stage. So you just expanding and uh, all directions expand at the same time. In fact, time also expands. <laughs> One can think in this particular metric also, it's very specific form of writing this so-called conformal metric. Yeah, and uh, in, the, in, this, in this particular form, you get uh, here the, um, okay, you get just expansion of your universe. And one can show that uh, electric field in this background will generate you electric current. This electric current will be proportional to the uh, conductivity, which is proportional to beta function and the rate of expansion. 
tau. And I must say that it's, it's given, uh, it's, uh, this result is given in the uh, first order approximation. So it means that uh, higher, we consider that tau is small here. So we did expand over tau. And it turns out that you can get non-zero conductivity. You can get negative conductivity. And in fact, you can get even negative conductivity in that, in that system, but it's fine because system is expanding, it's not closed. So, and uh, those such, such kind of effects were also observed in completely different literature in cosmology and astroparticle physics. So it's a completely different setup. Uh, they found that indeed you can induce electric current in its the universe. It's kind of kind of Schwinger effect, which you have you have particle antiparticle creation due to electromagnetic uh, background field, and this field will induce you in this expanding background the current. And this current will be directed to electric field, but with the coefficient which can be either positive or negative and proportional to beta function. It's first effect, okay, maybe it's not so much interesting, what I would say, but another one is maybe more interesting for condensed matter because uh, one can also consider magnetic field. So you don't have any violet expansion, just take something, apply a magnetic field. And if you have, again, this space dependent background and this space dependent background, again, I say trust there is no matter, chemical potentials are zero, temperature is zero. You will get kind of, you will generate electric uh, current this electric current will be perpendicular to magnetic field and also perpendicular to the to the force basically like we would call it force to to the to the direction of the deformation of space because this f is proportional to gradient of this tau factor which either uh, rarifies or dilutes your space or shrinks it back or makes it uh, i would say denser but now i'm talking only about space not about not about matter at all so one gets electric like, currents which will be running around. It reminds a little bit like whole effect. The only thing that we don't have any electric field there. So you can get with magnetic field, you can get some magnetization current which appears in the, in the, in the medium, basically, with this scale magnetic effect in this particular case. Okay, and this you say, okay, so what? I mean, you have this uh, astral anomaly, gravity and kind of thermal kind of transport, but can can we apply it somehow to our system? And uh, uh, the question, what is the, can we do some relation to real crystals? Okay, in fact, the uh, gravitational field is quite small at our scales and we cannot do that. We cannot see it actually in, in, the, in the good accuracy, at least in um, this thermo, thermomagnetic thermoelectric experiments but i would like to say that uh, the electric one can relate the um, thermal um, uh, thermal effects with the presence of gravity and that's uh, called uh, thomas fast effects or latinger relations in the in the in the uh, um, um, when we talk about condensed matter applications. The idea here is basically quite simple. So that if you have system in thermal equilibrium, then you should, uh, you can bring some matter from one part of the system to another one, assume that it's closed. And if you bring it from one part to another, you can transfer entropy from one part, part to another, or you can transfer also energy. And since uh, entropy and energy are conserved quantities there inside, if, since you're in thermal equilibrium, you have to have relations of energy is zero. Uh, then, so it's you maximized uh, the, the, the entropy of this system, then it means that uh, an energy which comes from this system and enters this system are the same because your system is closed. Then you can see that variation between uh, entropies and variation of energies uh, of, of, this, of this transfer are related to each other. And since they're related to each other, then those derivatives must be the same. So derivative of entropy, uh, what comes from this system to that system and with respect to energy which comes from that system to that system are the same because we're in thermal equilibrium. And it means that the temperatures must be also the same at this part and that part because derivative of energy or derivative of entropy over energy means just the definition of temperature, inverse temperature. So inverse temperatures in this system must be the same. So now let's put this system into a gravitational field. And if you put system into gravitational field, we will get immediately that if you take some energy from that system and bring it to that system, it, it will have actually this piece of material have to do some work against gravity and uh, something which appears from there and comes here will not be the same. So something which end with this system is not the same which like that one. So there will be some modification due to gravity. And if you com com combine all those factors uh, together, you will get that in fact, the temperature in thermal equilibrium in gravitational field will not be uniform. So uh, one gets that uh, the temperature will be local function of, of coordinate and it will be proportional to square root of uh, uh, zero zero component of metric tensor. That was Tomer Ehrenfest law, which was derived uh, in 1935, as I remember. Yes, and uh, year 30, sorry, 30. 
and uh, that's uh, that's why you can relate kind of variations of temperatures you can relate to the, to the presence of static gravitational field to inhomogeneous of static gravitational fields and if you work in linear response approximation you say that everything is small so variation of temperature is small and the variation of gravity gravity is also small you can express then in newtonian approximation this zero zero component of metric as a function of uh, gravitational potential so which is added, added to just normal minkowski metric plus a little bit of gravitational potential and uh, in earth this is a very negligible effect it's extremely small it's difficult to measure but if you think about application to, uh, to, to to material physics, so you would like to say, okay, I would like right now to study the response of my system with respect to variation of temperature, it's the right thing to do. It's exactly, you can just use gravity instead of temperature variation. You can say, okay, you see, since the gravity is related to temperature, I can mimic temperature variation as variation of gravity. And then you come to Latin relation. You say that variation of temperature is related to variation of the gravitational potential. You can work either with that or with that. And you can study then use Kuba formula formalism using just uh, not variation of temperature, but rather var variation of uh, gravitational potential as your seed kind of function. Okay, so uh, and then uh, one can see, oh yeah, we know that, but we know that in fact uh, we know that we have the scale magnetic and scale effects. We know that if you have gravity, then you can have some effect due to the uh, due to the quantum fluctuations, due to the generation of scale anomaly, we have those. Those, but gravity is not actually real gravity. We can trade it off for variation of temperature. That's why we should expect some thermal effects, and um, those thermal effects appear. So here I will briefly mention transparency, just what what we'll just what we'll, we'll get. So we can think about gravity as uh, instead, of, instead of gravity, you can think about variation of temperature and consider the experiment where we have, for example, temperature gradient uh, along uh, some direction of say. Deoxy metal or velocity metal that depends on the stuff that you consider, and if you put magnetic field, then in this situation, if you have this uh, oh, sorry this uh, experimental setup, you'll expect that you generate the um, you can have generation of electric current as we said. So as we said before, there should be some generation of some kind of bending of electric current as in, in the presence of the of the uh, of the of the gravity of the ground some ground field, and in and also in the presence of the magnetic field. And that's exactly what we will get here. So we'll get kind of nearest effect. So in the presence of magnetic field and temperature gradient, you'll get electric current, which uh, will uh, move, which will be transferred perpendicular to the both, to the temperature gradient and magnetic field. And it will be felt like a transverse voltage in your system. So, so you get it in the transverse voltages, transverse, uh, transverse difference in potential uh, with respect to the temperature gradient and magnetic field. So this system can have some specific um, specific results. So you can get it. And uh, uh, the interesting point. So we hope that these effects can be applied to the to the um, to the condensed matter setup. And I would like to say that the scale magnetic effect is similar to uh, similar as Hall effect. Let me just briefly mention this transparency and move further. So that's not a single level phenomenon. So it's it's vacuum phenomenon. You don't need matter to generate it. You don't need one electron to move in along the boundaries, for example, in the clean material. No, you don't need it. So it's just vacuum effect. It appears due to the fact that you have some particles which pop up from the vacuum. And it has a gravity origin basically. So you can explain it in terms of in terms of energy of the tensor, trace of energy momentum tensor, which is intrinsically coupled to gravitons. So you can explain it in terms of angular di diagrams in some specific uh, backgrounds. So it's 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 interesting phenomena which has origin from um, from conformal uh, symmetry violation, which is not uh, which is not the whole effect. Okay, and then you can ask, okay, but I just mentioned it with boundary. Let me uh, say uh, something about boundaries. So about boundaries is the following, that uh, since I don't have much time, um, we have, okay, we have boundary physics, for example, when people talk about boundaries, they say about bulk boundary correspondence, about higher uh, higher, higher order anomalies, which we heard yesterday in the first talk, or quantum, quantum field hole systems and so on. Here, I will be talking about just about Valsey metal. So we don't have any topological installator or nothing. We just talk about, think about, uh, say, okay, Valsey metal, say, let's, let's simpler, let's talk about uh, Dirac's metal. So we have some material where we have the, uh, some, some the some free fermion, okay, fermion which interacts with some background, electromagnetic background, and we have a boundary. Okay. And I would like to say that there are some effects which we are, people discuss in different contexts, and sometimes they appear somewhere in a completely different contexts. Uh, and most important part, at least for some audience, 
appear somewhere deeply hidden in the in the appendix, well, but it then this become famous and appears again. So here I would like to say that there was a paper which was okay, it's a gravitational paper. It was published in the journal, which is called Classical and Quantum Gravity, and uh, somewhere in the appendix you can find this expression. So it's written in very specific notation. If you if you decipher that and write it in normal expression, which we work right now, which we work with, 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 with which we work right now, thirty years later, you'll get something like that. So what does it mean? It means the following. Here I say that okay. So I will decipher it a little bit later. So what does it mean? So we have here some system where we have a boundary. So we have three plus one dimensional system with a boundary. And this boundary is just perpendicular to me, actually. It's, it goes to the screen. This boundary has uh, some vector n. We assume that it's flat for a second. So it's, it has some vector n, which is normal one, and it's here. Then you measure close to the boundary some current. You say, okay, I would like to see whether there is a current. And this current is J, it's here. It's written again in those Lorentz invariant notations. Here we have, we assume that this might, you have some material which is, have some interactions. So it has some quantum fluctuations. So as I said, in materials which have interactions, you assume that you, you know that you should get some kind of beta function. So your uh, numbers, classical theory will be just constant, but in quantum theory, they will run. So they will depend on the interaction scale or interaction energy. So you must have beta function. And finally, F menu is field energy. Sorry, it is field strength tensor. So it's basically magnetic and electric field. So that formula which appeared here, we should we translate it here. It's just this one, it's exactly the same. So you have magnetic field, electromagnetic field, uh, you have uh, normal to boundary, you have uh, distance from the boundary to the point where you measure current, you have beta function, and finally you have current. That's formal. Now you say, okay, what does it mean? It means the following. It says the following. So if you have material which say I assume that there is no matter at all. It means that you work at low temperatures, or it's better to say zero temperature, and work at exactly charge neutrality point. Okay, so you work say in the zero same metal. Then in this situation, you should get current generated along this boundary in the presence of nothing. So you just apply a magnetic field, and you will get here. You will get here current. Moreover, this current must explode when you once you move to close to the boundary. So you take you take this point, move it closer, and you will see that current will become like one over x it should explode. So the effect is totally unexpected because we heard about bulk boundary correspondence, we heard about some topology, spin hole effects, and so on. Right now, this effect appears basically from nothing, just from interactions. There is no topology at all. There is no Barry Chern uh, numbers, nothing. There is no Barry phases. There is no matter. It's vacuum current. And there is no quantization because normally, uh, when you look to those numbers which appear say, in those spin holes and other logic oscillators and other, so you know, some Haldane systems and so on, you know that you have some number which is quantized or well defined, like, you know, like central charge, which is kind of one over 12, for example. Yeah, okay, it's a very good number. Here you have beta function, which can be in different theories, it can be different and it's not quantized at all. Moreover, you can get some quantum correction to that. So you get a completely strange thing. And the question is whether that exists or not. That's a prediction. And uh, how to explain it? And that's kind of scale magnetic effect at the age, I would say. So it, it's, it has quite interesting origin. It's actually an extremely simple thing. So you know that you know that vacuum kind of boiling. So it, there are vacuum fluctuations. So particles appear or disappear, appear or disappear from the vacuum. If you put a magnetic field there, then you will see that, okay, some particles say appear at point A, and then goes, say, negative charge will go this direction, positive charge will go that direction. Magnetic field, they will close. They will follow Landau orbits or cyclotron orbits, and they will come, come back, and they will annihilate. Nothing happens. Now you put here the boundary, and if your particle appear to move in different directions, in these directions, for example, then you will see that, or like, okay, let's, for example, take this C point. The electric particle will move in that direction. So positive particle will move in that direction because we have magnetic field. And it will just find the boundary, gets reflected from that, and start to move in this way. And another particle, it's antiparticle, its counterpart, will move in opposite way. So in principle, you see that, oh, wow, if I have particle antiparticle equations close to the edge, then there should be current, which must be generated there. Moreover, the closer I, I to the boundary, the more chances that that boundary, that current will survive and not be annihilated by something else. That one also can be shown. That's why the closer I am to the boundary, the bigger the current is. So basically, I recover this kind of dependence. So I will have electric current proportional to some factor, which is depending on beta function and the distance to the boundary, that in times 
okay, the product, which is N, the normal to the boundary times magnetic field. So normal in this direction, magnetic field towards me and current will move to the right. So it will get current due to quantum effects that this current will not be quantized. So I will just briefly finish because that's 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 uh, basically the one of the talks, uh, one of the important points of the talk. I would like to say that this current has been measured on, on first principle simulations. We took some theory, which is called scalar QED, and uh, we measured this current. So we just put here the boundary and measured quantum fluctuations and found that indeed, if you have, for example, just just a brief flash transparency, say that this is distance from the boundary. And this is current which we measured, I mean, calculated numerically from first principle simulations. We found that this current is indeed exploding once you go to the boundary. And it's indeed, uh, it, there is no quantization, no quantum hole physics, nothing. You just, you have, you have just, uh, okay, you have no edge quantization. It's, okay, let me know further. So you get, you get basically what you get, you get the magnetization current which appears in the system due to quantum effects. The current will move inside the system only, it cannot exit it. But it's more inside, and this current can be actually quite big. It can be a few percent of the whole current. And I would like to mention that whole current, uh, whole conductivity, uh, it's known at extremely great accuracy. It's known at accuracy up to, up to 10 minus 10 precision, or say 10 minus 8 accuracy. So it's extremely, extremely high accuracy measured in those materials. I mean, some in, in, in uh, where quantum flow that can be measured. So, like say, like like, like in uh, graphene or in um, some uh, semi, uh, semi semiconductors, right? And here you see that you have can get huge correction due to magnetization effect. It's magnetization effect due to quantum fluctuations in uh, sufficiently clean material. So it's a little bit shocking, I would say, and that appears again due to presence of beta function. So it appears due to scale anomaly and due to interactions. And this effect can be explained very easily, just okay, at least understood very easily. So, uh, the uh, what just I will finish in one second, basically, I started a bit later. So, basically, what happens here is that you just, um, if you think about the just if, if, if you think about the um, uh, screening of uh, material, so for example, if you have some charge and you think about vacuum as a material then you will get that okay you know that scale anomaly must be uh must be present as the must be visualized as kind of screening of your electric charge with respect to um, particle antiparticle pairs which due to particle antiparticle pairs which appear from the vacuum so they appear disappear appear disappear form kind of dipoles and screen uh, electric charge that's what happens in the vacuum but once you get a boundary your boundary must affect the screening because uh, here there exists nothing and here we have your material so you have kind of half of the screen and an electric charge close to the boundary will be stronger than electric charge out of the boundary it's why boundary should feel uh charge normalization and we must get the kind of font formal anomaly must feel the boundaries so there should be boundary effects always okay so that's basically i finished so i'm a little bit uh i'm not sorry i'm not in time probably but uh the let me just uh stress uh, again let me just move a little bit further so just yeah so let me just mention that uh, what they what i said about and what i did not say about so so close to reflective boundary of these systems okay so you can have conformal anomaly in number of uh, number of systems you can have it at reflective boundaries i discussed just recently you can also have in the bulk in unbounded systems at all so the electric current and the magnetic currents they are proportional to beta functions we discussed in fact that's what i did not mention what i didn't have time to mention here is that you can get actually you can measure the analog of that um kind of magnetization current whole type of magnetization current on quantized one you can also get it in the in the deroxy metals using some electrostatic experiment which you didn't have time to discuss but it's accessible in principle it's possible to measure and one can measure really beta function in real material just using just electrostatics type of thing and yes and the scale magnetic effect leads to edge currents at the charge neutrality point at zero temperature and those currents are non-quantized okay i finished thank you very much okay Thank you, Professor Chernodub. Um, we have time for two two questions, more or less. So, are there any any questions? No. Okay. So, so I had a I have a question. So, so in this last example where you have a conformal metric. I, I don't know if the dimensionality of the system was two, two dimensional or 
or well, uh, sorry, two plus one dimensional or three plus one dimensional. But uh, if you have a, an expanding metric, you should have a singularity, right? That x x equals zero, and also you should have a probably a, a something like a cosmological horizon. So do they play any role in you know in the anomaly? I think maybe something like. Yeah, people actually people discussed it long time ago, and they discussed it actually in the case of photon type of production type dependent cosmological background. It was written as usual long, long time ago. Okay. And things are discussed again. So it was considered uh, what we right now can call scale electric effect. So they considered indeed this particle production. But I must say that this formula is written for the case where you have a small correction. So it's kind of Kuba formula. So it's kind of linear response theory. So we expand or Kind of we consider slowly moving the ground so it's not completely applicable to this point so in this point one should write another formulas and that's actually a big question what happens here because okay you can have kind of new particles appear from the vacuum positive and negative you have particle creation and you can also generate magnetic fields because you generate also electric currents and those currents can move and then can generate their magnetic fields and it can solve puzzle of magnetic field creation because we have two strong magnetic fields right now at an intergalactic or uh, intercluster basically scales so it's uh, difficult to explain it can be due to conformal anomaly but i would like to say that those formulas are written in simple approximation when we have just a little bit uh, perturbed uh, flat background so okay okay there Thank was you. by alexandro i think someone asked yeah already. there was there was a question somebody raised their hand but then they they unraised their hands. So, uh, okay. okay. Uh, Alejandro, can you unmute yes. yourself? Yeah. Ask. Yeah. So, I was, I, I would like to ask uh, in the slide of the running Fermi velocity in graphene. Uh, oh. Yeah. So, what, no. where, where you have the hourglass Dirac cones? Ah, uh -huh. okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here. So what does it mean that, because it looks as if the Fermi velocity does not change in the same way for every, every value of the momentum. Right. So that's why it looks like a little bit like an hourglass. Yes. So what, yes. what does it mean that the Fermi velocity change? Uh, okay. Then I have to come a little bit back just to explain it, but it's okay. As, as all explanations will be not complete, but just let me come kind try to come back. It's picture is very similar to this one. So at short distances, you have kind of, okay, you can think about a little bit in this setup. So you have here a uh, speed of light. So you have some speed of light of interaction, inter propagation of interaction in the system. And it, uh, it runs fast, very, very fast, three times, 300 times bigger than the velocity of uh, your particle. And if you run for, if you, if you have your particle has long wavelengths, then it has a chance to survive long time, say, just, I, I'm just discussing how to represent it because you asked about qualitative analysis. And it will interact with those particles which propagate faster uh, with photons. And photons will basically accelerate your particle and you'll start to move it faster than it should. That's why if you long uh, run for a long time, so you consider a long wavelength of your particle, of your, of your Fermi particle, it will have more chances to interact with the fastly running photons inside your, your, your system. And this interaction will slow down photons and will speed up fermions. And that's why at high, at large distances where you consider very, very long particles, then uh, the speed of light will catch uh, Fermi velocity and Lorentz invariance, what we call will be restored in field theory language. So it means that Fermi velocity will get, uh, will be faster and speed of light will be slower. And uh, basically that's, that's, that's light, which will try to accelerate your photons, or oh, sorry, your, your, your um, Fermi velocity particles, and this is your, your Fermi particles to accelerate them and to move faster. And that's why you see hard glass here, just because of that, because you kind of uh, here you stay, you have long wavelengths, very, very long wavelengths. Wow. And to get this long wavelengths, of course, particle interacts with phonon, phonons faster and uh, it will be accelerated basically, and their velocity will be fast. But one should say here that in graphene, uh, the velocity of light basically, okay, velocity interactions are basically simultaneous. So it's basically, uh, you can say, you can think that the uh, speed of light is infinite, infinity basically, because it's momentarily interaction between two different points. And that's what considered in this type of approximation because, okay, that's just specific, specific nature of graphene. Yeah. And, uh, 
Yeah, that's also that's that's how you, you can understand it. So your particles, uh, when they move long, when they have longer wavelengths, they should move faster. But of course, it's it's theoretical limit, so it will never be achieved. But but still, we, we see this kind of this kind of hoar glass picture. Here it is just it's you see kind of explosion. So this is n. It's just the density of particles, density of particles, which is controllable in experiment, and this density. Uh, you can control the position of the Fermi surface, so you can control Fermi energy with this kind of uh, with the density. And you see this hieroglyph here. Okay, I think I think um, Professor Rutia has a, a question. I hope it's a really quick question yeah. because we don't have much yes, time. Yes, yes, a quick question. Just about the same uh, no. transparency. Which kind of diagram do you calculate in order to find the running of the Fermi velocity? Oh, okay, these are these are three three, three diagrams which are. Let me just show you. Don't write it. These are basically three diagrams which are in textbooks, um, which appear in textbooks. The only thing that you, I think, you don't calculate this. Um, uh, yeah, this is basically th those diagrams. So, for example, in in the topological materials in this three dimensional, calculate those three diagrams. That's all. So, okay, you just you know you just you have you have you have some experiments in front experiments of interaction correction uh, so you have uh, fermions of interaction you have polarization tensor and you have vertex correction that's typical qd uh, qd uh, qd things and the, the only thing that uh, in two, in, when you consider two plus one graphene it's actually not two plus one it's kind of mixed dimension because your photons can propagate outside uh, you know because they propagate in three-dimensional bulk while electrons can propagate only in two-dimensional bulk that's why you say, oh, no, 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 I will not take into account this complicated kind of light propagation. I will just basically shrink this diagram and consider that you will have just only only just momentarily interaction. So basically, we'll have kind of no local photo interaction. That's why this this diagram can be kind of circumvented a little bit. But the yes. price you pay that you don't have randomization of electric charge. So this diagram basically helps out. Thank you very much. OK. OK, so. let's 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 thank uh, Professor Chernodub again and uh, we'll now move on to the next talk.